everybody thanks for watching and welcome to greek mythology value one i could have really started out with this video and put this out but there's so much more uh you know information it's sort of a you know prerequisites to this video that i wanted to get out and get people to understand before we got into uh this kind of information and as you'll see you know when we go along you know it requires uh prior knowledge and as we get deeper into this series you'll understand why because it entails a lot and deals with a lot of history history that has been hidden from us for too long now it's crazy to me when you when you really pay attention and look at Greek mythology and you read the books and you understand what it's talking about, how people cannot make the comparison and make the connection with biblical religion and religion, you know, uh, all the major religions that we see today, for that matter, uh, besides Buddhism. But um, you can understand that. When people make the connection as I have uh, made the connection in my videos uh, about the Hebrew Israelites, when I keep talking about the Greeks dealing with this Bible, dealing with Judaism, when people make that connection and give you this kind of information, it is very clear. If you just read certain books and understand certain Greek authors and Greek scholars and what they talked about way back, uh, you know, B.C. time. I mean, they basically give you everything you need to know to understand exactly what happened in history as far as why uh, and how the Greeks uh, did what they did. So this is what we're going to get into. and We're going to look at Greek mythology to do so. And it's important. So what I want you guys to understand and what I have talked about in the previous videos on all of this is you got to understand one, you know, the Greeks. You had the Greeks and you had the ancient Egyptians living peacefully in Kemet. That's a fact. This is something that nobody can deny. Everybody came into Kemet to learn. When people say that, this is not something that we have to speculate about and just, you know, just say to try to brag as African people. It's a fact. It's something that they admit themselves as well as the Romans and everybody else admit. Everybody came into Kemet to learn. Everybody came into northern Africa to learn. Proven fact. So when you have this kind of relationship going on, you had the Greeks coming into Kemet and they was living there. You know, they set up civilizations and they lived and they stayed and they learned from the Africans and everything was fine. Everything was all well and good. It was a good civilization, as I talked about. Now, you had other people at the top who had other plans for Kemet and for that knowledge. And they had other ideas for, you know, that kind of information. So. When you pay attention to the Persians coming in to uh, Kemet and taking over, the reason why I said before that this was an inside job, because one, you have to understand there is no way that the Persians will have attacked Kemet if they did not know 100 percent for sure that the Greeks would not intervene. They knew they could not beat the Greeks and the Egyptians at the same time. It would be impossible. When you understand the close relationship between the Egyptians and the Greeks, you would think that, well, if I attack them, then the Greeks are going to intervene. Not to mention, you have the port in Phoenicia that I talked about in Ancient History Volume 1. You had everybody using that port and the Phoenicians there. You had the Greeks uh, there. And for the Persians to come in and to attack would just be stupid unless they had a guarantee that the Greeks would not intervene. So this is why I believe it was a setup and the Greeks were involved. We only have one account of the Greeks actually helping, trying to help the Egyptians during this time. And they sent out a ship to help and the ship was sink. Uh, so it just doesn't fit for the Persians to make this kind of bold attack on the Egyptians without knowing that the Greeks will intervene. And it's a lot of information about, uh, you know, the uh, Persian king sending a word to Alexander saying, you know, don't intervene and that they're supposed to be related and all this kind of stuff I talked about in Saturn Satan series. So we know we had the Persians go in there and conquer the Egyptian ter territory. They would eventually uh, conquer it. Remember, the Egyptians fought back. And we know that the uh, Persians eventually prevailed. Then we know that the Greeks came in there and uh, conquered the Persians. And that's another thing that's suspect, because remember, it is said that Alexander didn't even step foot 
inside Kemet before they actually conquered the Persians. So it was either possibly some kind of agreement that went on that the Persians would go ahead and conquer the Egyptian territory and that the Greeks would take over. Or, um, you know, maybe they uh, double crossed the Persians or something like that. But the Greeks, who could have easily, you know, helped the Egyptians after everything the Egyptians did for them, could have easily intervened and helped Kemet and, you know, easily defeated the Persians. But they didn't do that, which shows clearly that their agenda was to allow Kemet to fall. There's no other way around that. Their agenda was to allow Kemet to fall so they can eventually uh, get in there and get what they got from Kemet. And as Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben kept saying, nobody came to Kemet's aid. Nobody came to the aid of the Egyptians after everything they did for the people and everybody who came in and got knowledge. Nobody came to help them when they were bombarded with so many attacks from the Persians and then later the Greeks. So, as I said before, I mean, it kind of sort of fits the MO that we see from our government today. We have um, one, you can't, you know, the Greeks can't just attack Kemet. They wanted Kemet. They couldn't just attack Kemet because, you know, the Greeks lived there. You have people, Greek citizens who lived in Kemet and it would have been suspect. It would have been like, you know, you know what's going on. So to get another, you know, group of people to attack them and then the Greeks come in and say, well, we're going to try to help the uh, Egyptians out and, uh, try to take the, the country back, you know, and do what's right, you know, sort of like what America does today. And, you know, we, we understand that they started the whole thing from the jump. So this is what the Greeks did, you know, same type of MO. So once the Persians came in there and took over, the Greeks would later come in and take over. And as I pointed out before, you got to understand that the people in those territories, I'm talking about stretching from Kemet, Egypt, all the way over to Lebanon. We understand Israel as well was a part of the Egyptian empire. So those people in those territories were African people, uh, you know, when the Persians conquered and when the Greeks conquered. So these are the people who they had, you know, under their control. And you have to realize that these people were Africans. And as we can see, as I have shown you, they basically tried to get these people to worship them as gods. As I showed you, the Serapis, uh, Ptolemy dressed as an Egyptian. Now, we can go back and look. You're not going to find no depictions of Greeks dressing like Egyptians until after the Ptolemaic rule, until after they came in and conquered Kemet. So this goes to show, one, the fact that we have Zeus, Amon, that we have Serapis, that we have all these uh, Greeks trying to copy and mimic what they seen in Kemet shows you that this is what they was trying to do. They was trying to get the Africans, the uh, Egyptian people to worship them as gods and the Egyptians wasn't having it. And this is how I said to you guys how they came up and why they came up with Judaism. So one of the main things I want to point out to you and show you is how it's the fact that they hid all of this, you know, inside of uh, the Torah. They hit Greek mythology in biblical religion. And when you understand Greek mythology and what it's speaking about, this is easy to see, easy, clear to see. So we got to uh, you got to get people to understand one because get this argument a lot. Greek mythology predates any biblical manuscript that we have, including the Septuagint. Greek mythology goes back to at least 1000 BCE. So we understand that, no, the Torah did not exist. The Bible did not exist. No proven biblical manuscripts existed before 1000 BCE, period, point blank. So we can just end that noise right there because you'll get a lot of people that say, what are you talking about? You know, the Bible predates Greek mythology only in the Bible, only in the Bible. There's no document nobody is going to produce that they're going to give you any kind of uh, manuscript that's going to predate Greek mythology, period. So suffice it to say, the stories and the stuff we're going to talk about here predates anything biblical. And when you see that, and since we can prove this fact, you have to only come to the conclusion that this is where your biblical religion came from. And this is where uh, Greek mythology stole uh, their stories from ancient Kemet, as you'll see. 
And all of this stuff, as we've been saying for years, goes back to ancient Kemet. So now, first thing I had to do when I started getting into this information over 15 years ago was to try to figure out what was the origin for biblical religion. What is their explanation of where this stuff came from? And as I talked about before, it goes back to Ptolemy II in Philadelphia. So when you get into the letters of Orestius, and it's talking about, you know, Ptolemy II in Philadelphia is basically commissioning six Hebrew elders, each from the 12 tribes of Israel, to come to Alexandria, Egypt, to do a translation of the Hebrew law to Greek. And they supposedly did this translation really fast, and this is how we get the Septuagint, Greek. So this is the official explanation for where the Torah began. Now, when you start looking, many people give you the biblical explanation that is not proven. So this is where the whole misconception that, you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. This is where all that comes from. So you have a lot of people walking around with that knowledge and repeating that, you know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not Greek. But there's absolutely no proof of that. This is what is said. In a book, this is what is said by scholars, but it's no proof. We have no proof whatsoever of a Hebrew manuscript that has existed that predates the Septuagint Greek. So the simple fact that you have the Greeks involved and when you start getting into the stuff that we're going to talk about, it's all suspect. So we put that on the table first. You got the Greeks involved, all this stuff still surrounding the Greeks, the very people who conquered Kemet. Think about that. The very people who was forcing Hellenization, the very people who was trying to push the rapists and all these gods. Think about this. This is this is the part that has me baffled with people like what the hell is wrong with y'all? When you go back and look at history, you see the Greek hands in everything. Their hands are in everything, everything dealing with biblical religion, everything dealing with pushing any any kind of ideology was coming from the Greeks. You have nobody talking about these Jews or Hebrews. Everybody's talking about the Greeks. So when we see that and we see the fact that once you get the Greco-Roman era and the type of conquest these people did, the type of, you know, uh, you know, intellectual domination that these people put on, you know, the people back during those times. I mean, they controlled everything. And this is all the stuff you have to take into account. You have to just take into account and listen and understand that that when you're going back to ancient times, to B.C. times, you're dealing with the Romans, you're dealing with the Greeks, plain and simple. So we got to keep that in mind. So now there is no way that after you see this video, you're going to have any more doubts about this stuff. It's not too many people talking about it. I don't see too many people that's going to be giving you this kind of information that we're going to get into in this DVD. And um, it's a lot of people that that don't really get deep into uh, what this stuff entails, which we will. So plain and simple, there are seven Greek poets, scholars, historians that you need to read and understand to really get all this stuff. Seven. You got three P's, you got three H's and you got a D. There's actually more, but. I'll go with this seven because these are the seven that I researched that I got my information from as far as putting these pieces together and looking at what is proven or what they have out that is proven. And um, it's no way that you can read this stuff and understand that one, it predates biblical religion and not make the connection. So we have Plato. We have Plutarch. We have Pindar. We have Hesiod or Hesiod, however you want to pronounce his name. We have Herodotus, we have Homer, and we have Diodorus. If you pay attention to those seven poets, scholars, historians, researchers, whatever you want to call them, they have all the answers. We can throw Virgil in there as well. They have the answers. You pay pay attention to what they wrote and the information that they put out. I mean, it's, it's no way. You can look at just uh, Hesiod and uh, Herodotus, Theodorus, the people who was around during this time. We're talking about before and after uh, Greek con- conquests, people who was there to see the Egyptians and understood what they looked like and what they was doing. And people who understood what took place, uh, Theodorus understood what took place and that the Greeks was basically portraying themselves to be uh, ancient Egyptians and hiding all of their mythology and religion or what have you within uh, the Greek mythology and within religion itself. 
All this stuff is revealed in their books. All this stuff is out there for people to, to, to basically take in and read. And if you don't, then you're going to have a lot of questions. You're never going to be able to put this stuff together. Luckily for you, I did all the hard work, which I expect you to do your own research. But after this, you won't have to. So now understand, as I have been saying, the Bible, the Torah, the Torah itself does not predate the fourth century BCE period. This is around the time when you had the Greeks develop the religion. It does not predate the fourth century BCE, which is why they had to put in the Bible that God destroyed Israel a whole bunch of times so they can account for the lack of evidence, the lack of bodies. So he destroyed, you know, Jerusalem and Israel so many times or what have you. What about the bodies that was under the ground already from the people that was, you know, dead? Why would you destroy dead bodies again? How come we're not digging up any Hebrew bodies or finding any Hebrew ruins or civilizations? So this is why they put that stuff on the Bible so they can try to explain why we can't find any Hebrew civilizations, any ancient uh, Jewish civilizations that predate the fourth century BCE. Plain and simple. So this is why stuff is in there. So now any so-called ancient Hebrew artifacts that they find, any kind of artifact that they find that has so-called ancient Hebrew writing or paleo Hebrew or what have you, any of that kind of bullshit that they find, it belongs to the Phoenician Canaanites. Plain and simple. It belongs to the Phoenicians or the Canaanites. And they're trying to pass it off as Hebrew. That's a fact. There was no such thing as no damn Jews or no Hebrews during that time. So this is why they get into the whole paleo Hebrew because they know, one, that the Greek language developed from uh, the... um Phoenicians and that the Hebrew language supposed to as well develop from the Phoenicians. But how is that possible when, you know, the first people supposed to be uh, speaking Hebrew and Moses supposed to have spoken Hebrew? You know, what is that all about? To get two different stories, conflicting stories from Bible scholars who one people would say uh, that the Hebrew uh, uh, language, the language developed on its on its own. It didn't come from any other language. That Hebrew was the first spoken language. And then you get people who will say, well, you know, Hebrew had to develop from the Phoenicians. And um, this is why we get this whole paleo Hebrew, because they have to attach themselves to something to give them validity. So when you see any kind of artifact or anything that is so-called paleo Hebrew or what have you, it's Phoenician, it's Canaanite, and they're trying to steal it. That's a fact. Besides the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks was the first to speak about God walking among men. God's walking among men, people praying to God for material things, people being punished for sins or what have you, people going to an underworld, people going to a heaven. Outside of Kemet, the Greeks were the first ones to do it, and they were the first ones to put their stuff into an organized religion or an organized practice that we call Greek mythology. Plain and simple. When you understand that fact, it is not hard at all to understand what has taken place and what they've done. And, you know, this stuff is ridiculous to me that it's you have the whole world deceived by this. And it just takes reading two books to figure out what they did. Knowing history to figure out what they did is frustrating. So when we get through this video and you see and you look at this stuff, it's, it's so easy the way I'm about to put it to you. That it almost seems unreal. That it's like, huh? It can't be that simple. It's not. But it's going to look that way. But if you don't speak ancient Greek, if you don't know about this stuff, if you don't have the time to really dig into this kind of information, you're just not going to get it. Couple that with the fact that you have so much enforcement and so much to back up the uh, lies of biblical religion, which is why it's hard for a lot of people to get this. And a lot of times when you look at the debates and arguments, the whole thing can be settled with them just going back to Greek mythology and destroying anything biblical, which I'm about to do here. So you have the Greeks talking about worshiping gods and gods coming down and uh, mingling with men or what have you. And you understand that the the world at that time, the world during that time was really caught up in, you know, spirituality. They were trying to figure out where it came from. It was a lot of interest 
and uh, anything spiritual and anything that had to do with what was going on and, and how they got there. So they put these stories together, same as the ancient Egyptians did, to basically hide the science and math behind it to make it more explainable for those in the mystery schools. And this is what took place. You had the people in the mystery schools understand what was being said. And if you want to give people knowledge and just say, well, maybe you're not old enough to understand this stuff. So I'm going to give it to you in little stories to give you a meaning. When you read a bedtime story to your child, you give them a story. But in that story is a moral to the story. So this is what these mythologies was about. It was giving you stories. But the moral to the story had to do with the origin of life how we got here and, you know, science, math, you know, physics, geometry, all this stuff is wrapped up within these stories. So this is what it was about. And this is what the Greeks copied from the ancient Egyptians who taught them, you know, about all this stuff. So now let's get into this stuff. We know you have Genesis, you have the Bible, you have God creating the heavens and the earth in six days rested on the seventh day, days. So now if you read his size or his yet, however you want to pronounce his name, if you read his Diogony works in days, he explains how the gods created men in five different ages. So you have the golden age, the silver age, the bronze age. You have the age of heroes and you have the iron age. A lot of you know about this already. But if you read the book, you should have absolutely no questions about where this stuff came from. So when you understand one, when you get into works and days, I mean, it gives you everything and you can understand where they got it from. But when you get into works and days, he's basically breaking down Greek mythology as we know it. And you can see exactly where they stole a lot of the biblical concepts that they have. Got it right from works and days, which Hesod wrote this, uh, I believe, 700 BCE, long before the uh, Greeks conquered Kemet long before any biblical anything. So you have, as you know, a Greek mythology. Remember, Prometheus stole the fire from Zeus and gave it to men. Now, a lot of people don't understand it was Prometheus who created men. Remember, Prometheus created men, which explains why this movie was called Prometheus and is dealing with the creation of human life. So Prometheus, the god, uh, Greek God created men. He stole the flame from Zeus. And um, basically, remember, Pandora was created and released all the ills on mankind because of what Prometheus did. So when you get into works and days, let's read here. I'll start here. It says the lame God molded earth as Zeus decreed and to the image of a modest girl. Great eyed Athene made her robes and belt divine seduction and the graces gave her golden necklace. And for her head, the seasons wove spring flowers into a crown. Hermes, the messenger, put in her breast lies and persuasive words and cunning ways. The herald of the gods then named the girl Pandora for the gifts of which all the gods have given her. This ruin of mankind. The deep and total trap was now complete. The father sent the gods first messenger to bring the gift to Epimetheus and Epimetheus forgot the words. His brother said to take no gift from Zeus, but send it back, lest it should injure men. He took the gift and understood too late. Before this time, men lived upon the earth apart from sorrow and from painful works, free from disease, which brings the death gods in. But now the woman opened up the cast and scattered pains and evils among men. Inside the cast, hard walls remain one thing, hope, only which did not fly through the door, the lid stopped her. But all the others flew, thousands of troubles wandering the earth. The earth is full of evils, and the sea disease come to visit men by day, and uninvited come, against, come again at night, bringing their pains in silence, for they were deprived of speech by Zeus the wise. And so there is no way to flee the mind of Zeus." And now with art and skill, I'll summarize another tale, which you should take to heart of how both gods and men begin the same. The gods who lived on Mount Olympus first fashioned a golden race of mortal men. These live in the reign of Kronos, king of heaven. And like the gods, they live with happy hearts, untouched by work or sorrow. 
vile old age, never appeared, but always lively limbed, far from any ills. They feasted happily. Death came to them as sleep, and all good things were theirs. Ungrudgingly, the fertile land gave up her fruits unasked. Happy to be at peace, they lived with every want supplied. Rich in their flocks, dare to the blessed gods. And then this race was hidden in the ground, but still they lived as spirits of the earth, holy and good, guardians who keep off harm, givers of wealth. This kingly right is theirs. The gods who live on Mount Olympus next fashion a lesser silver race of men, unlike the gold in structure or in mind, which we'll get into. So it's giving you almost the same kind of concept with uh, Genesis, when you understand that all mankind is doomed because of the actions of Adam and Eve, which doesn't seem fair. Same here in Greek mythology, you have Zeus basically punishing all mankind because because of the actions of Prometheus. So when you understand one, uh, you know, Ares, remember, didn't find favor in men and Zeus didn't really like us either. So, you know, uh, Prometheus still in fire, which is the icing on the cake. But you kind of sort of have that same kind of concept with this uh, punishment that mankind receives because of the actions of a few. So Pandora releasing all of the ills on mankind is the same as Eve biting the apple and releasing the same on us and damning us from uh, paradise. Because it said before this happened, everybody was you know living fine. There was no illnesses, you know, until all of this happened. So it's giving you that same kind of concept. It's also calling Kronos the God of heaven. And we know Kronos is uh, Saturn, you know, Roman Saturn and Saturn is Satan. So it's giving you these connections here. So you have, you know, Satan being a God of this world and Kronos being the God of heaven. And when we get through this, you'll understand how all of this is really going to connect and show you that it's, you know, it's all talk about the same stuff, which is obviously clear right now. So one of the things you have to understand, remember it said that death was like a dream, which is a huge hint right there. One of the things you have to understand about uh, in Greek mythology is that when people died, they became demons. So, uh, demons or demons, however you want to pronounce it, we know the word, uh, translates to demon. So demons were good in Greek mythology. Demons were not a bad thing. It's what people became. They wanted the earth. They did different things. Either they went to, uh, Elysium, which we'll talk about later, or you went to Hades or you went to, uh, the pits of Tartarus, which we'll talk about. And, um, this is what happened when people died, when men died. This is what happened during the golden age. So when you read about uh, these daemons, now when you read the etymology, it says daemon comes from the ancient Greek word, which originally referred to a lesser deity or guided spirit. The word is further derived from the Proto-Indo-European uh, daemon, provider, divider of fortune or destinies. Daemons are benevolent or benign Nature spirits being of the same nature as both mortals and deities, similar to ghosts, thonic heroes, spirit guides, forces of nature, or the deities themselves. According to Hassad's myth, great and powerful figures were to be honored after death as a daemon. From Hassad also, the people of the Golden Age were transformed into demons by the will of Zeus to serve mortals benevolently as their guardian spirits, good beings who dispense riches. They remain invisible, known only by their acts. So now, if people don't want to accept the fact that you have the ancient Egyptians already talking about an afterlife, talking about an underworld, Speaking about gods walking uh, among men or what have you, we can go to the next civilization. We can go to the Greeks who also spoke about a heaven, who spoke about demons, who has themes that is, you know, uh, related to or the same as biblical religion. Not to mention the fact that we have the Septuagint written in Greek as well as the New Testament written in Greek. All of this stuff is suspect. Talking about a God of heaven, talking about demons or what have you, it's clear as day, you know, what took place. But this was the golden age. 
when you get into the silver age, it's not so much, uh, difference, not so much that happened. The silver age, Zeus made men, you know, uh, weaker than the men during the golden age. They wasn't equal to the men during the golden age, but they still, uh, live, you know, in the hundreds. They lived long. They worked though. They tilled the ground. But the problem was they didn't worship the gods, so Zeus basically killed them all. And that was the Silver Age. <laughs> but we get into the Bronze Age. Now, in the Bronze Age, let's read. You know, real quickly, it says, Zeus the father made a third generation, which gold was the first, silver was the second, this is the third. So Zeus the father made a third generation of mortal men. A brazen race sprung from ash trees, and it was in no way equal to the silver age but was terrible and strong they loved the lamentable work of Ares and deeds of violence they ate no bread but were hard of heart like adamant fearful men now i'll stop right there because uh when you get into the bronze age the bronze age when you start reading and uh getting into it it's a lot to get into but when you read the Bronze Age and you read the Book of Enoch, you can see where they got it from. Everything that they explain in the Book of Enoch about how evil men were during that time. During that time, it was eating men, it was killing men, it was a lot of war, it was building weapons and everything like that. They wore body armor, they was teaching the men how to do crazy stuff. This is the same type of stuff when you get into uh, the Iron Age, uh, the Bronze Age, excuse me. That was going on in Greek mythology. Same type of stuff. So when you look at even still in the Bible, when it's talking about right before the flood, what was going on? You know, man was evil. Every imagination, every thoughts of their heart was evil and wicked or what have you. And, you know, God killed them all. It's the same stuff. So we can see right here in the Bronze Age, it's talking about wicked, evil men and what they was doing. Now, the part that you can't let slide. That a lot of people probably did when you start reading about this is the part that when it says that men was made of ash trees, ash trees. If you ever had one of those trees in your backyard or in your neighborhood, you ever see one of those trees when you shake them, you had these little helicopter little leaves to come down to come down like helicopters spinning. Those are ash trees and uh, those are the seeds actually from ash trees. But. When you understand what ash trees are and the reason why they put ash trees in uh, the Bronze Age, why it's talking about this in Greek mythology, is because ash trees has a taxonomic rank of genus. Genus, like genes. So it has a taxonomic rank of genus, which taxonomic is basically a biological classification of, you know, uh, organisms and fossils.